Thank you so much for joining the Pathland today on Care Transitions, Left Without Being Seen in ED Throughput Review. As a reminder, PATH leadership land tools and resources can be found on our website along with all of the um, content that we have from any previous land sessions that were shared, especially the AIM-3 and the AIM-2 materials. So please remember that that's there and if you have any troubles, just let us know. I'm one of your facilitators for today, Francesca Flores, and our other facilitator will be Carrie Howard from Bemidji, Minnesota, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Carrie now. Thank you, Francesca, um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are going to be talking about our favorite topic, the AIM-3 and ED-related data and processes. <clears throat> Um, we are going to start our, our session hearing from two more facilities. So if you remember or you attended last month, um, we heard some report outs from some of our facilities and we've got two more to hear from today. And then we will be hearing again from Dr. Pamela Acid, who spoke with us in April. And she's going to be able to get into a little bit more detail about some of the ED throughput processes. Um, and specific roles and some of those things that we didn't have time to fully cover the last time she spoke. Uh, then Artis is going to come and talk to us a little bit about some final updates, uh, knock on wood, final revisions to our ED forms and data submission processes for AIM-3. And we will have some time for Q&A for Dr. Acid and for all of our speakers. And um, then we are going to make sure that we put up a poll. We are seeking some feedback from you about potential LAN topics as well. So if you will please, before you sign off, please complete that poll as well. That is greatly appreciated. All right, next slide. Um, for this session, we were actually able to obtain some continuing education credits. And so we, need to make sure we share some of this information. For those of you that are interested in that have attended the live session today, you will be receiving an email with more information about how to complete the evaluation and then um, receive those credits. All right, next slide. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Melanie Barber. She is from the Northern Navajo Medical Center in Shiprock, New Mexico. So Melanie, um, if you haven't already, please unmute and I'll hand it over to you and Francesca to walk through your slides and your presentation. Thank you, Ken. Did I get it unmuted? Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right, so good morning. I'm Melanie Barber from Northern Navajo Medical Center. I'm the emergency department supervisory nurse. And uh, next slide, we'll get started on this. Um, I actually am gonna add to, uh, there are four of us who are doing our chart audits. Uh, my case manager, my clinical coach, and one of my lead nurses. We started out auditing, um, I kind of came in as a surprise on this information coming in. So I just did 25 for the month of January, February, and March. We have now increased that to, we are doing 20 a day. Um, we each take five and we do it at a certain time so that we're not over, we're not auditing the same charts. Um, so on this first slide, have the AIM-3 measures successfully been integrated? Yes, um, all of our patients received discharge instructions. We, I, I say all, we occasionally catch some from uh, our ED West, which is our fast track, that have not gotten them. They are given ver verbal discharge and our um, providers make sure and document that, but we are slowly getting them around to, uh, doing the the written discharge instructions and uh, like I said they're still missing it missing it occasionally um, our case manager attempts to contact all hundred percent 
uh, we contact 100% of our left without being seen and our left before treatment complete. Um, he, and I say attempt because obviously people don't necessarily update their phone numbers. And then when we call, we leave messages and then it's, you know, it's up to them to call us back. We'll try maybe twice, depending on, on what, uh, if any labs and stuff are done or if it's something that we're really concerned about. Um, right now, our left without being seen rate is point uh, is one point eight percent. Next slide, please. We started in April uh, measuring our improvements for our triage accurate, accuracy. For the quarter, we were at eighty six percent. We had everybody do the ESI um, teaching tool that was sent out and we have increased in April we went up to 93% accuracy um, we did implement or we have already had a provider in triage and so we kind of changed the role just a little bit they are starting a lot more of the labs and the x-rays and everything it, from the pit and then they are being sent either to ed west which is our fast track or back to the er uh, but if we have if we're clogged up then we at least have labs and stuff started and that's when we really get if, if something concerning comes up and the patient is a left before treatment complete um, our case manager really stays on the ball and, and gets those people called and either gets an appointment or invites them back to the emergency room uh, right now our median length to stay is approaching 120 minutes um, there are just uh, that is very provider driven there are, and it's also the amount of patients that we see um, are uh, if we reach over a hundred patients a day which is quite frequently the case then we have a lot more problems with our flow ED flow and uh, again it's provider dependent we just have some providers that aren't as quick as others um, on the next slide, please. On our what measures are we still working on to meet the targets? We've assigned more training for our triage nurses and we are working with providers to consult with our case manager for patients that need a schedule follow-up so he can help make them an appointment. Um, I was talking to uh, Carrie and them earlier and the problem that we have here is that if we try to schedule an appointment for them, we can only schedule it 72 hours in advance. Uh, and that has to do with the, le with the no calls, no shows. Um, after uh, three days, there is an approximate 50% chance of them no calling, no showing, and then it increases. So when our providers write, you know, follow up in one week, there's just no way for us to make an appointment for that. And so we're, we're working if anybody has any suggestions and uh, just let us know. Next slide, please. Uh, there's just what we are finding is there's just not enough staff. Um, if you are going to have us call 100% of our patients that have been seen in the ER, we would have to have a dedicated, probably two people dedicated to do that and our case manager just doesn't have the time. And I know that's a problem for everybody. Staffing is a big issue. So uh, that's that's what we have here. I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, if there are any questions for Melanie, we can take maybe one right now. Um, but otherwise, please, do enter your questions into chat and we can hopefully address them at the end of this session. And if we run out of time, we will capture all of the chat questions and get them answered uh, in, a, in text format in a document that we can post to our, to our session, uh, session website. Um, so I'm just gonna pause quick. Are there any questions from Melanie? Okay, so hearing none thus far, um, we are gonna move on to hearing from a couple of folks from the Claremore Indian Hospital in Oklahoma. So we have Stephanie Porter and Davida Vaughn that are going to be speaking. 
All right. There we go. Hello, Spirit. Can you hear me? Yeah, yep. Yeah. All right. So this was written, obviously, for the May um, report, um, and I was going to be out of town. So um, it still says CDR Dana Cash was going to be representing the ER, um, but obviously it's myself, Stephanie Porter, and Davida Van, my case manager, um, who will be going through the slides today. Next slide. Um, and I already told you that stuff. So a little bit about our facility. We have 10 beds, one triage room. Um, Staffing Monday through Friday, we have a physician that's here um, from eight to four. And then otherwise we have a AM provider that's six to six, a PM provider that's six to six, and a mid that's 11 to 11. So during the week, Monday through Friday, eight to four, we have three physicians on staff. Um, nursing, we have uh, four nurses on the floor and then it just kind of scatters there. You guys can read it. Um, and we keep up with our volume pretty well. Next slide. Um, this kind of shows that we're growing. Uh, it just shows our trends of daily patient volume starting in 2013 through now. Um, obviously, this year um, will change some because uh, it's just this first five months in that average. Next slide. And so the AIM-3 measures successfully have been integrated in the service unit, QAPI program, and how. And next slide, we'll go through those individually. And on the ED discharge planning, um, our patients are given instructions to return for worsening of symptoms, um, for following up with a specialty service like podiatry or surgery clinic. And they are given referrals to follow up for outside service. Um, on the discharge follow-up, 90% of ED patients with the disposition of home or home health will have a documented attempt of phone call within two days. Um, our units actually requested clarification on this measure um, from leadership regarding inclusion and exclusion criteria, possible script for phone call, um, credential level of staff needed to perform these calls, and we've requested dedicated staff that would be able to make this volume of phone calls daily. Um, discharge follow-up, 100% of patients discharged with follow-up required in discharge plan have a post-discharge phone call within two business days. And for this measure, we audited the patients that had in-house consults to surgery clinic, podiatry, and women's clinic. We still need to find a better way at our service unit to track required follow-up. Next slide. Um, on the ESI accuracy, um, copy review, 100% of hospital emergency departments will complete a monthly random sample. Um, Claremore Indian Hospital has completed random audits of ESI since 2017 and reported them to our copy department. Um, no RCAs have been required and we've had no fallout. Um, our accuracy has been 100%. Um, you that ahead of time <laughs> that we've audited back to 2017. Um, we'll have a 95% accuracy rate for ESI by July. We're already meeting that. Next slide. It just kind of repeats itself, I guess. Um, on our left without being seen patients, 100% of left without being seen patients will have a documented attempt of follow-up phone call within two days. And we should see a steady improvement on this measure um, because we recently added an ER case manager, and that's Davida Van. Um, she's been assisting me with that. Um, our left without being seen rate has been less than 4% ongoing. Um, we were meeting this requirement prior to the past AIMS. Next slide. And this one shows you kind of what we've been dealing with here. The number at the top, and um, like 3764, et cetera, across the top there. That's our patient volume for the month. And um, the 0.98% January of 18, going across to the right um, to March of 19.8%, um, that's left without being seen patients, the percent of volume. Um, if you look up there on the little graph on the right, it shows our um, compliance, if you want to call that compliance. <laughs> Um, our follow-up phone calls, um, our DC plan, required follow-up 
fall percentage, um, ESI accuracy, left without being seen callback, and then our times. Um, our triage times have actually improved um, from these uh, numbers here. We and we had been running around six to seven minute arrival to triage times prior to the beginning of this year. Uh, next slide. What measures are we still working on meeting targets and what are the next steps for our unit to achieve the targets? Um, we are reevaluating the current discharge paperwork utilized in the ER, um, revisiting required follow-up versus return for worsening follow-up as needed, differentiation, which means, so everyone that goes to the emergency department, when they're discharged, we tell them, if you are not getting better, if your symptoms get worse, we want you to come back and see us. We're here to take care of you. Um, is that a required follow-up? I don't believe that it is, but we still are requesting clarification on that. I would say that people that require follow-up are people who have a referral or have had a consult ordered or have a chronic condition and they they are being hospitalized and they need to return to be evaluated, that, that kind of thing, not just, hey, you have a cough, you're not better if you start running a fever, come back and see us. Anyway, um, and we requested quality text for the 100% callback requirement. Again, awaiting clarification. Um, ESI, we're going to continue to have our nursing perform random chart audits monthly and continue to refer these to the ESI work group for review and to QAPI. Next slide, please. Um, which part of this topic is most challenging to implement? Um, the post-discharge follow-up contact, again, waiting on clarification on that measure and then discharge plan for each patient. I mean, that one, I think that's been removed from our data collection tool at this point. And what area would you like additional support? Um, just improving reports that are available from the ED dashboard. Um, and then of course, on everyone's wish list, implementing a better EHR IHS wide, capable of patient specific discharge education, chart completion audit. It would almost be easier to audit paper medical records very labor intensive for people who are not familiar um, with our EHR. Next slide. Um, success support. <clears throat> the speaker on 4-4 um, said that her reports take her about an hour a day and other EHRs, they can run those reports to compare benchmark data like door to EKG times, door to CT times. They can calculate the trends, slide ER crowding, show utilization percentage and productivity. Uh, productivity, allow you to review your own charting for completeness and offer actual discharge paperwork with instructions that are tailored to the patient. Ours don't do that, it's labor intensive. We have to do several um, different reports to get the data and a lot of it's hard chart auditing. Um, having to sit through that unstructured having to data. Shift through unstructured data. If it was on a flow sheet or a paper form, it may be easier to find some of the data. So it would be very labor intensive. Uh, next slide. And um, I think I guess that's the end of mine. <laughs> Thanks, Stephanie. Um, there were a couple of questions. Um, one question, and I think you sort of talked a little bit to this about. Um, from Renee, uh, how is time captured from triage to MSE? Okay, so on so on our tracking board, when we go into that, if the providers put in the time that they go into the room, it would be easy to run this report. The way that I have to run it right now, um, we have our CACs here that are able to run special reports, and it takes them two people approximately two hours to type and type and do some magic on the keyboard and get us this data. And we only have two physicians in the ER that routinely put in their MSE time. So the criteria I gave them was to utilize either the time of the first 
order because our doctors do not put in orders until they see the patient or the time of the first entry into the patient's chart, like the note, whichever was better. And that is what they utilize for our um, time of door to MSE. Okay. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, we are going to move on and hear from Dr. Acid, but of course, if there are more questions that you have, um, please enter them into chat. We will either answer them verbally at the end of the session or, uh, like I said, answer them um, in more of a text uh, Q&A document format. Um, Thank you, Francesca, you were on it for me. <laughs> we have, today we have uh, Dr. Pamela Acid returning to us. Um, she's the director of the emergency department at uh, Sky Ridge Medical Center in Lone Tree, Colorado. So outside of Denver there. And um, hopefully you all were on in April when she was here. Um, she is back by, by high demand to, to share some more with us. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it out over to you, Pam, and you can take it away. Thank you, I appreciate it. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? All right, so uh, next slide. I, you guys have already talked about this. One of the things that you're measuring or you're left without being seen rates, which is a standard for all emergency departments because it's truly a patient safety issue. Um, very important that we have processes in place to make sure that we minimize and mitigate our left without being seen rates to the best of our abilities. Next slide, please. So um, this just talks through the EMTALA requirement that you have to have some kind of a process to track anybody that leaves against medical advice left prior to triage or left prior to medical screening exam, depending on how your organization defines all of those. Um, there is an expectation um, under uh, Intala that you have a way that you track those. And then internally, most organizations have some kind of a process where there's some type of follow-up with those patients, whether it's a phone call, um, depending on if you're um, a part of a, a system such as myself where I've got six um, other ERs in my general location, we can look to see if a patient showed up there, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this just talks a little bit about elopements. Uh, again, that's the patient leaves, nobody even knows if they have a medical device in place like an IV. That can be a risk, um, particularly with, um, I don't know how your patient population is. I have some patients that enjoy having that easy access to a vein um, so that they can go down to the little heroin marts and um, get there and do some shopping and, and get their high. So, um, we do actually engage with law enforcement to do welfare checks on those patients um, and to ensure that the patient is safe, that the device is removed, and that we don't have a, a patient that ends up having a major safety uh, risk because they just left the department and we can't uh, locate the patient. Next slide, please. Uh, throughput, which is a huge thing for all of us, isn't it? Um, pretty much everything from the time they set foot in the building until the time they leave the ER is time stamped. Um, within uh, the QAPI, the target's 120 minutes uh, from door to discharge for those discharge patients. And so some of the things that might be helpful, having some type of a triage initiated within 10 minutes of arrival. In the literature, there are um, a couple ways that that's done. Um, somebody mentioned a PIT, provider and triage. Uh, having uh, that first across the room assessment. Uh, you can also have a pivot nurse, which is something that's been described in the emergency nursing literature, where this nurse literally does a quick eyes on of the patient, has a quick set of vital signs to ensure that they have some stability to them, and then um, assigns a quick ESI based off that. And then they go to a separate location where they're more fully um, data collected on why are you here, what's your medical history, et cetera, so on. Um, again, with that target of 120 minutes discharge length of stay, there is also a, an, a bit of an onus on our uh, provider partner that they initiate their medical screening exam. Uh, there have been a, a couple of uh, different studies done within my corporation. I'm 
part of a larger hospital corporation. Um, it's uh, HCA, Hospital Corporation of America. And uh, we collect data from 220 different uh, emergency locations within our company. And the data uh, on our company side does show that if we've got a patient that sees a, medic sees a credentialed provider within 10 minutes of arrival, the likelihood of them leaving is a lot less than if they're waiting for an hour to see someone, even if they've had a triage process initiated by a nurse. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the way that we, in my department and in my uh, district facilities in the Denver market, broke down our overall discharge length of stay was we tried to figure out how many patients do we have that are ESI 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And based on that, what time allotment can we have for each of those ESI levels? This goes back to the triage accuracy. So the more accurate that your triage is, then you can rely on the fact that, yes, this is how many patients I really have in this bucket of ESI. So then you can say, okay, if 30% of my low acuity patients, which typically in the literature is considered your ESI fours and fives, then I probably need a discharge length of stay target of 55 minutes for those patients so that I can have more time for my ESI threes and twos who require a bit more of a workup, depending on what, where your percentages are. And it does help to look at um, the ER as a process from the time they come in till the time they leave. So door to greet or door to MSC, door to start of treatment. From the time the order was run to the lab was um, sent. From the time the lab was taken in lab till it was resulted. From the time the result was given to the provider. So that you can determine if maybe some of your essential departments are potentially um, have opportunity to improve some of their process flow so that they can get results back much more efficiently to the ER provider so they can have enough information to make correct medical decisions but also not lag on them. I will tell you, as every one of your organizations probably has, I have some providers that are more efficient with their medical decision making than others. Um, the nurses have been given tools that they can flag the chart, which is tracked electronically so we can even say, you know, we flag this chart for this provider five times during this visit for them to make a medical decision when they still didn't. And then those fallouts get sent to my medical director for him to do follow up with those providers. Um, unfortunately, there is somewhat limited control that I have over um, my providers. That being said, often it's just helping them get back on track. So my, my charge nurses do spend a lot of time going, hey, you know, Dr. So-and-so, PA so-and-so, you've got a lot of patients who've been here for two hours already. What's the plan? Have you thought of them? And frequently what we get back from our providers, oh my gosh, I kind of forgot about that patient. I got sidetracked by this one. Yeah, absolutely. Let me get back in there, circle with them. I think we can discharge them. So often it's just helping them refocus as well, especially if you're in a, 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 a area of time, which most of us have that peak time in our departments where there's just a lot going on and it's really easy to lose track of things. Uh, and then, of course, hospital throughput. One of the big barriers that my um, facility struggles with is admitting patients out of the ER to inpatient. And if I can't move them out efficiently, then I can't free my beds up for my patients in my waiting room that need to be seen. Um, so we've actually had to do a lot. There's a lot of pressure on us in the ER to move patients in and out efficiently. So we're doing a lot of what we call waiting room medicine, which is neither popular with us nor with our patients because I can't get my admissions out efficiently. And so we have actually brought in uh, one of um, our other directors in the building has had the um, Six Sigma training and is a black belt in that. And so he has come into this meeting. He has really no skin in the game with it. So he's an objective party as well. And is gonna break apart the processes and find out where we've got opportunity to make things flow more efficiently on that component. Next slide, please. The rest of these slides, these are just some examples of some front end processes. Uh, I, I talked about this back in April, but there have been a, a couple of uh, ERs in the uh, country that have been cited by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services because they did not have uh, good enough front end processes, so they got in tele violations. 
Um, in one situation, a patient filed a complaint that they waited for two hours before anybody even um, greeted them. And in fact, that was accurate that a qualified medical provider did not, in fact, greet this patient in a timely fashion. Another facility was cited under Impala because the qualified medical provider did greet the patient within 10 minutes and put orders in, but nobody carried those orders out for two hours because they did not have resources allocated to the front end to get those processes initiated. Realize that medical screening exam is itself a process. It is not a point in time. In order for a qualified medical provider to say, this patient does not have an emergent or urgent condition, frequently they need labs or radiology studies in order to make that final determination. And that's why the front end processes are somewhat uh, important in this so you can prevent those Impala violations. Because if you haven't you might have initiated the medical screening exam process, but if you haven't actually done all of the other components necessary, then you still could have an Impala violation. Next slide, please. So this is, um, it came out of uh, an article in the Journal of Emergency Nursing some years ago about how they tried to do immediate bedding, and then if they were not able to immediate bed, what processes then were sent back towards the front end or, or triage part of the department. Again, just an example uh, of something that's out there. Uh, next slide, please. This is another example of immediate bedding. Uh, a facility, again, uh, tailored it to their workflow, and it just made it a lot easier for them to say, okay, these are the things that need to happen in the main department. These are the things that should happen in triage, depending on what our status is as far as uh, patients being able to get direct into a room. Uh, next slide, please. This is yet a third process, um, and this was something that my um, shared governance committee, where I currently work, came up with uh, about a year and a half ago. They looked at uh, four or five different uh, research articles, and from that, they created, based on how our design is of our department, what happens at what spot in the front end, and then who does what. And so the next several slides simply go over each of those roles for those people, as well as what the expectations are in the main department. The staff overall drives this process. My role is them telling me, hey, this isn't working or this isn't working, and then working with my shared governance committee to then determine where we have opportunity, is it a person or a process? Because if it's a person, we can retrain them, but if it's a process, process isn't working, what can we do to better support it? Do I need to find more resources, that kind of thing? And so you can flip through these next several slides. They're all tied to this intake flow process. Um, they've identified triage alerts. These are the ones that notify the charge nurse and attending physician, hey, we have a patient that has something of great significance and I'm gonna need a rapid evaluation of this individual. And the providers do like having this to find out. They actually were the ones that helped design a lot of these that way then they, they have a little skin in the game because they designed it, but then they are aware, oh, I need to stop what I'm doing unless I'm resuscitating a patient and go see this one and make sure that they're stable enough that they can wait or if I need to initiate something faster. Um, next slide. Um, IFP stands for the intake flow. Again, these are all of the different um, things that the charge nurse does. Next slide. Also assigns what the RN or the medic in the intake area, what their responsibilities are. Next slide. The EMTs, that's what we call tax. Um, so we are um, EMTs, medics, and RNs. Uh, we do not have LPNs in our ER at this time. Uh, next slide. Again, defining what the tech can do um, that's within their scope and legit within both the state as well as the facility. Next slide, please. Uh, what Station 1 does, going back to that footprint, uh, that, that map at the start, just what every station does and what their um, intent is for each person to do. Next slide. Talks about station uh, one with some specific um, situations, like if there's a lot of patients or if we've got an alert that needs to go out, and how they uh, do some handoff with that. Next slide. 
that talks about what station two is and how we try to um, have a, that somewhat segregate patients in the waiting room. That's a challenge because often they don't want to do they don't want to follow the instructions. But it does help for us to um, identify these patients have already been triaged; these have not. Um, when the patients are able to do that for us. Next slide, please. Station three, that's um, kind of where all of the starting of the IV, maybe doing some of the POC testing, doing the EKGs occurs and, and what those expectations are around that. Next slide. Uh, what happens in the waiting room and what happens with the hourly rounding? There is an expectation um, that I have for my team my company has an expectation around ESI2 patients that if they're in the waiting room for more than an hour, that there's very specific things that have to happen. And so it, quite frankly, is much easier to put them in the main department, even in the hallway bed, than to leave them in the waiting room. And I think that was kind of the intent. Um, unfortunately, I've got a very high number of ESI3s, very disproportionate to what the CDC data shows as well as my company's data. And frequently those patients wait for two to three hours in the waiting room when we've got large boluses of patients. So there are expectations every hour of what needs to happen with those patients, um, including repeating a vital sign and providing them an update on their plan of care, whether that's by the nurse um, in the intake area or the uh, qualified medical provider. And we've got some processes in place for that. It, there are days it works phenomenally well, there are days it does not. Um, those tend to be the days where myself or my manager are out in the department helping with some of those flow issues. Next slide, please. Um, when the patient goes back to a room, how do we communicate with the nurse in the back? Because usually if we're that busy that we have patients in the waiting room, then our nurses in the main department are running around. And we do have a secure texting app that we can text each other through and say, hey, you have a new patient in this room, this is what's going on and everything's done or hey nothing's been done you need to get in here that kind of thing uh, next slide please and then once we go back to our normal steady chaos level um, where do we need to do cleanup what do we need to focus on can we pull resources from the front we don't leave um, resources sitting in the front if there's no patients to be seen then we can recycle them in the back um, we will send people um, home on call to call back in if we need to, depending on what our volume and acuity is doing. So that way we can stay within our um, productivity means, just like everyone else. I, I don't have a stack of money sitting around to have people sitting here doing nothing. And I've also found that as much as I love my team, if I, they have a lot of downtime, they tend to focus on things they don't need them focusing on. And suddenly the patient isn't a priority anymore. So um, we, we try to make sure that there's enough work for the people that are working. And if we don't need all the people here, then we do send people home. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this talks a little bit about the post-discharge phone calls. And I will tell you that uh, this is an area that we have uh, struggled with. I'm listening to all of you, I'm like, wow, this is the same here. Uh, how are we gonna do it? Um, me personally, um, the way that I uh, staff my department, I don't believe in a lot of administrative overhead. So I don't have a dedicated educator. I don't have a dedicated business person. I don't have a dedicated um, admin to do administrative tasks for me. Um, I, I have myself as the director. I have my manager who is also part-time um, direct patient care staffing. And then I have a, a quality person and I invest, I, I actually inherited him when I took over this department four years ago. Um, and I've changed and adapted his role over the four years and he's been wonderful and game for that all along, um, God bless him. But he manages some of my chart audits that I don't do. He also does our post-discharge phone calls. That being said, um, there are uh, plenty of patients we can't reach every day. What we have found with the post-discharge phone calls is that they are hugely important to not only ensure that our patients felt that they got the care they deserved when they came to our ER, but also that they got the connections that they needed with the follow-up. Uh, thankfully, I have a patient population that's fairly well educated, they have insurance, so follow-up tends to not be as big a problem for them. That being said, we still have a lot of, um, of patients that need help. Our goal is to attempt 
of our discharge phone calls every within 48 hours of their visit. In order to do that, we have um, my quality um, nurse ends up doing about 60% of those discharge attempts. And um, our, we have a separate pediatric emergency department I don't manage. They only see about 14 patients a day as their average census. So they have nurses that have time to be able to call patients. Uh, so they end up calling about, or attempting to call about 40% of our patients that we see in our ER. Uh, and that's fortunate for us, um, because otherwise I wouldn't necessarily have that particular resource. Um, but it does take everybody. Um, one of my peers who works at a competitor, actually, we try to get together every few months and catch up on some backups as well as what are you doing. And he actually has um, a school of nursing that he's partnered with, and they have nursing students and, who come in and will help do discharge phone calls. Um, we've got nurses in the, our facility that are on work comp. So they can sit and do a phone call, but they might not be able to do direct patient care. And, and so we try to figure out who can we utilize to uh, get to this 100%. Next slide, please. These are just some resources um, that talk a little bit through some of the data nationally, standard definitions for ED processes. So if you've not had an opportunity to look at all of your processes um, stepwise and maybe set times out, this can help with that. And then some topic briefs on admission flow. Next slide. And then again, uh, some more resources about um, just general over quality, um, quality improvement as well as discharge phone calls um, and discharge process. I've seen a couple of questions come up about our volume. We see about 100 to 105 patients a day. We admit about 30% of our patients and we uh, have about 28% that arrive by ambulance. My um, low acuity, my four and five ESIs, the national average is about 25 to 28%, we set at about 9%. Uh, so I've got 72% ESI 3s and about 22% ESI 2s. So uh, very heavy acuity um, from a, a patient care perspective. Um, additionally, um, I specifically, um, my manager and my charge nurses, we also, in addition to discharge phone calls, while patients are here in the department, try to uh, talk to at least 40 patients a day specific to the quality of the care in the department and where we have opportunities. So um, we have a lot of focus on our patient's experience and what we need to do to make things better. It's a challenge um, to make it all work. And so typically, I'm usually physically in the building by 5 a.m. so I can catch some of my night um, patients as well as my night shift. And then I'm usually here till about 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. Um, and we really have a fairly structured process on who works with what nurses as far as ensuring that they're all providing consistency from triage acuity, from patient flow to patient experience. And so it takes all of us together to make that work. Thank goodness. I've got a, a great team that supports me on that. I think that's it for my slides. I think so. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Acid, I am going to actually revert to a question that came up earlier. Um, somebody was asking about sharing documents or policies that relate to your um, follow-up phone calls. So I think this was specifically asking about the left without being seen follow-up contacts, but really for post-discharge contacts. Do you have scripting or anything that really lays out the details of those processes and or who you mentioned that you use a team to do that um, but yes yeah. yeah so we're we're fortunate in that our company invested in um, a product uh, that we actually um, studer group manages but we um, have purchased the ability to access the database so while uh, when a patient any patient is registered in the emergency department. As long as they are discharged out of the emergency department uh, to home, 
or um, assisted living or SNF, something of that uh, nature, those, that patient information goes into this database that then we can access here within our ER, my quality uh, person piece can access it. The pediatric uh, nurses can access it. And you can tell, it, it walks you, we have a design script, which I can send the questions to you guys. It's, it's, um, but we've got a script. It lays out what you say to the patient, information you're getting. Um, and then as the patient's telling you this information, you can load it into the system and then it saves it there. So once a week, I can do a data dump or every day or every hour, you know, if I was that um, excited to do it and see what the feedback was from patients, where we have opportunities, if there's specific issues that I can then pull the chart, look for the specific uh, care team and provide that feedback to them. And it's a little bit more immediate feedback to us. But it is a separate database that we use that holds all that data for us. So it's not a, a paper process per se. Sure, sure, thank you. <clears throat> um, and I have seen this question crop up a couple of times in the chat and I just sent some clarification, but um, I am wondering, um, and Joanne, if you are there with Jen or Jen, if you can clarify, um, are you asking about the AIM-3 definition for uh, required follow-up, or are you asking about um, people's existing processes and policies? Um, and it looks like there was another tag on question here. Um, this might be for you, Dr. Acid, um, including only patients where the provider follow-up is required. Does return for worsening uh, qualify as required follow-up? So for a discharge phone call, anybody discharged out of the emergency department is expected to get a discharge phone call. So at least check on them. Did, ha did you have any questions about your care? Did you get your scripts filled if we gave you any scripts? Um, was there a need for follow-up? Al alongside that, parallel to that, um, are the patients needing actual follow-up appointments? So a good majority of our patients are discharged back to their primary care doctors. We don't help them make those appointments. We don't facilitate making those appointments. The expectation is the patient makes those appointments themselves. So we still would reach out to call them. And only if they're having a problem making that happen would we assist. If it's to a specialist, however, like an orthopedic surgeon they've never seen, a general surgeon they've never seen, something of that nature, um, with that is a whole separate process. And, and again, I mean, we're a big, we're a big company. Um, we have a, a call center actually in Utah that manages our six hospitals plus um, all the hospitals in the mountain division. So I think it's like 15 hospitals. Um, the ERs that any patient referred to a specialist, that call center then reaches out to those patients to coordinate that for two reasons. One, the patient satisfier, but two, and, and just as important from a care perspective is we want to make sure those patients stay within our health system whenever possible because then we have continuity of care and a record um, that it's just much easier to ensure that the patient's care is transitioned smoothly and seamlessly. So you come to the ER, you've broken your arm, we refer you to Dr. Smith. You've never seen Dr. Smith before. Usually within 48 hours, our call center would have called that patient, said, have you gotten hold of Dr. Smith? You haven't, well, let's help you with that. They'll kind of connect them. And then they'll ensure that all the records, the x-rays, everything goes to Dr. Smith's office so that when the patient shows up, everything should be there. And so it should be a very smooth visit. That's the benefit of being part of a very large corporation. Trust me, there's other things that are not a benefit. That happens to be one um, that it is really good for our patients because it does assure that continuity of care for them. And it's very seamless. Instead of the patient having to go get copies of records or make sure that they find a release, we can manage all of that because all of our providers that we refer to are part of our confidentiality um, system, so we don't have any conflict with that. Does that address the question? We're getting some feedback there. Um, was that 
Jen, was that you trying to speak? Um, I think that is helpful when we're talking about this, this discharge or follow-up content so, or contact. So it's, you know, the aim is to contact everybody just to check in and make sure you're okay and you got the medications or whatever that might be. Um, but then also, you know, to check in, do you need help scheduling an appointment, you know, Mm. It can be a pretty overwhelming time whether you're being discharged um, from yeah. the or from the from an inpatient status or something like that. To it, it is helpful to to check in. Absolutely, and I, I again, depending on what's happening during the day, um, frequently myself and my manager when we're out in the department making those connections with our patients to make sure at the time that they're getting what they need from us. Um, we also can help facilitate patients making discharge phone calls. And so I frequently I find myself doing a lot of discharge because the primary nurse is busy with a new patient. And so I'll say, hey, I, I see on here that we're sending you to Dr. Smith. He's a specialist. Have you called his office? Why don't we call his office right now? And I found that at least half the time, you call the office, you would think the office would know because your doctor's been on our call panel that you're going to have an ER follow-up. And it is, they ask some of the most ridiculous questions of patients. And it really is very frustrating for the patients. Uh, and so my, by my being there and helping, I can actually facilitate and ensure they get a follow-up before they even leave the department. That is not every patient. That's maybe at best 10 patients a day. Um, but not every one of our patients needs a specialty follow-up either. So I would say probably 30% of our patients walk out of here having that specialty appointment before they even leave the department. And that's very efficient and, and does help. And the patients appreciate that because then they know what to expect. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. Um, I, I did just add into the chat too, just a thought so I didn't lose it. Um, but just to remember that with all of this AIM-3, uh, these AIMs, the goals, those things, um, it's okay for us not to be perfect right now. And it is okay if we are at, you know, 20% uh, of, of discharge contact or post-discharge contact right now. It's really meant to say, this is our long-term goal. This is what we're working towards. And yeah, we're gonna have bumps in the road and it's gonna take us some time to figure out these processes and those kinds of things. I think sometimes we get a little overwhelmed when we think about the volumes of patients that we have coming through and how do we contact and connect with each one of them as they're leaving. Um, so I, I just wanna make sure that we, that we do clarify that, um, that the purpose is to be improving and to be doing better and better and better. Um, and if we're not perfect, that's okay. <laughs> well, I appreciate you saying that, Carrie. I mean, every one of these initiatives, it's always about the patient. It might not come across that way, but it's always about the patient. And we want to make sure that we're doing right for our patients. None of us want any of our patients to leave feeling that they didn't get what they needed or that somehow they got lost in the system and they get a bad outcome. That's not what any of us want. Um, I can assure you, I, I'm sitting here and telling you all of these great things and they look great on paper. I am not perfect by any stretch across the board. I have some things that I'm totally kicking tushy on and I have a couple other things that where um, I got to figure this out. Um, thankfully, I've got a very engaged team and when they recognize and hear that, hey, we have a struggle as a team and we're not meeting something, they come up with some good ideas. Um, but Every time we implement something new, it takes a good couple of months for it to settle in, and then we go, okay, maybe it's not so overwhelming, and then we look to do something else after that. It, it, we don't do a whole bunch of initiatives at once if we can avoid it, because it's very overwhelming. So I appreciate you saying that, Carrie, because this is, this is the perfection that we all strive for, but potentially won't achieve. And as I frequently tell my boss, excellence is the enemy of perfection. And so I'm striving for excellence that hopefully will get me to perfection, but excellence is where we are today. And that's just what we're going to have to, to deal with. Thank you so much. I think that's a really, really good 
way to 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 leave you know these thoughts and some really great best practices and resources and things for us to take back to our own facilities and to say you know here's something that we want to try here um, so thank you so much um, Dr. Acid for coming back <laughs> and speaking to us in a little bit more detail about some of those processes and best practices that thankfully um, some of some of you have already figured out. Um, we do want to now uh, switch over to Artis. She's got a few updates about our uh, our AIM3 data reporting process. And so I am going to hand it over to Artis. Thank you very much. And I know we only have a few minutes, so this is the speed dating version, y'all. Um, next slide, please. Woohoo! Oh my gosh, so much kudos and thanks to every single facility. Everyone is sharing data with us. Some people are not doing all the things. And as we've just been talking about, it's totally okay to not be there. The name of the game is that we're improving, but everyone is sharing their data and I'm so excited about this. So I just want to take a moment to say how spectacular that is, how much that reflects everyone's commitment and how proud I am to be able to be involved with such a great committed group of people. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of the kind of data that you're going to be seeing and if you look at this it is so close to the recommended benchmark that we actually have to zoom in like on the next slide please to show how close we are to our target. So some of these measures we're doing absolutely great as a group. These are aggregated over all the facilities who are sharing data. Um, and if you look at the next slide as well. Um, we're seeing, so this might look like it's trending upwards. I don't think it is. We don't have a lot of data yet, so we can't see seasonal variation in this yet. Uh, as more and more comes in, we're gonna see more and more. There are a bunch of these visualizations. Um, next slide, please. Um, and they are covering all the AIM3 measures and the slide after that, please. And you're going to see these in conversations with your project managers for PATH. Um, and what these are, what these are for is to start with, we want to make sure that our data is actually reflecting what you have shared with us. So we're going to um, make these visualizations richer as time goes on as we explore data together. And that's kind of the approach we're taking with the reports here. Next slide, please. So as you know, um, a slight change of change of subject here, but still about data. Um, the measures changed earlier in the year to look at inpatient discharge planning rather than just ED patient discharge planning. And we've taken that as an opportunity to make the form for data entry more understandable. This is an example of what you will see. So I've just put for the first measure here. Do you collect it? How many discharges do you have? Did you use a chart sample? How many charts did you review altogether? And then how many discharge patients have that documented evidence in the chart? Um, I can't speak to how these measures should be defined because there's deliberate space in these for individual facilities to define their own measures. Um, but if you've got questions about that, please ask because I can definitely circle in the right people to have that conversation with you about about how that should work. All right, next slide, please. Uh, this is just because I know you're going to all get the slides from this. Next slide, please. This is just a reminder of how to do this. If you can please get your data to me by the second Friday of each month, because what I want to do is get data back to you by the third Friday of the month. And I can only do good averages for you all if everybody has sent that data in a timely way. And I know that you're all sharing data with me. Hooray. Um, I'm really hoping to get this now onto a more kind of measured, let's just have this as a month monthly thing sort of footing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this just outlines how we're keeping your data secure when you share it with us. It's all going through the secure data transfer service and then we are retaining it in a secured environment. Next slide, please. And lastly, you are invited. Um, I know that people have a lot of questions about what we're doing with this data and how it works and uh, what does reporting look like. 
and how to use the story that your data is telling you. So you are invited to an informal Q&A next month. There's no official land next month with the July holiday and so forth. Um, but Mary, Sarah and I would love to spend some time with you and answer your questions. And we've got a couple of backup topics if it should so happen that there aren't any questions. And I think that's all from me. Thank you so much, Artis. Um, like, like you mentioned, next month we do not have a normal land session um, due to the holiday. And so we are gonna have that informal Q&A session um, about the AIM-3 data and reports and all of that on the 10th. And then we will be coming back in August for our regular land sessions. And so in August, we are actually gonna be talking about just culture implementation. Uh, we got a few asks out there to the facilities that attended the training in Albuquerque to come and speak and share their share their insight about the just culture implementation. And with that, thank you all for attending. I am going to ask uh, my my tech hosts, thank you, to <laughs> put the sir or the poll up. And most importantly, we really want you to answer at least question number one, <laughs> so we can drive our topics for. Our September and October sessions. So thank you all very much. We'll leave the poll open for a few minutes here after the session.